Okay, this is part six. I'm going to go through this first section real quickly. I won't read the passage. We know we're dealing with that section that speaks about the praise coming from the children of God and that that is strength, actually. And so Jesus quotes that passage, just a reminder. He quotes Psalm 8 and he says, Have you not read out of the mouth of babes proceeds? And Jesus says, praise. But in all the translations, we read really that it means, in the Old Testament, it means strength. Okay? And this particular passage says, out of the mouths of babes and infants, you have founded a bulwark because of your foes. In other words, there was a purpose for this bulwark. And so Jesus, though, describes it as praise. And I believe what Jesus is doing is he's saying that praise and thanksgiving for what God has done for us is a demonstration of God's power, that he forgave our sin, and that that power, the blood, we, we know the Andre Crouch song, the blood will never lose its power. If you've heard it, it it's actually a wonderful song. We'll have to do it on a Sunday morning sometime. Gives me an idea for this Sunday. I don't know. <laughs> so anyway, the blood will never lose its power. That is our strength. And it is also why we praise. And so I really do believe as we look at these passages tonight that we never got to last week, I wanted to, uh, it's going to reinforce this idea that praise of God for his forgiveness and mercy and finished work on the cross is our strength. That's our wall. In fact, it calls, it says that we have walls of salvation. Walls of salvation. Think about that. That's our defense. And it was always that way from the very beginning. Remember, Abel persecuted, or uh, Cain persecuted Abel. And that's what Galatians says the Pharisees were doing to the people of God at the time of Jesus and Paul. And they were always accusing, always accusing. And so the story of scripture through God's forgiveness and his weapons that are not carnal, his weapons of warfare is the blood of Christ. They overcame. How did they overcome? By the blood of the lamb. You have overcome. We've seen that in John. So praise in the victory and strength of Christ. Jesus has already won. He leads us in procession. We talked about that. He's conquered the world. We have overcome the evil. The accuser is cast down and we are more than conquerors. All right. So this passage, what is victory and how do children triumph? How do children triumph? We are the children of God. Okay. Hebrews 2.14. And this is not a popular passage because we have a... Christian society that is so obsessed with the devil. They're just, they, there's so many people, and I, and I knew something was a little off in the early 90s when I read this book by a guy named Neil T. Anderson called The Bondage Breaker, right? And it has some good stuff in it. Don't get me wrong. There's, there's some good stuff. But basically, well, and of course, Frank Peretti, This Present Darkness, it was, it was a big movement that was going on in the late 80s and early 90s uh, that, honestly, I felt like it, in some cases, it was intended to bring fear to God's people. Talk about the devil. Speak about him, you know, just being uh, in your chords, your guitar chords, your amplifier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was at Calvary Chapel. I never heard anything like it. I had just gotten the music director position in November of 1991. And there was this really nice guy. Um, I won't tell you his name because you might know him. But <laughs> he, was a, he was a really nice guy and uh, very fun. Lived, lived there in Auburn. And great voice. Real energetic. But he would be praying. And he would be talking to Jesus. You know, gathered in a circle. And suddenly he would say, And Satan... <laughs> and start talking to Satan and saying, we bind you, stay away from our cords, stay away from these keyboards, stay away from the speakers. And 
it it was like why are you why are you doing this in your prayer and where is that in scripture that speaks about some external being invading our TVs and and whatever and i think a lot of people would look at something like oh the sound went out on a sunday morning oh the devil just didn't want you guys to praise the lord no 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 i don't believe that at all i don't believe that's what it's talking about i don't believe that was the purpose of the devil the purpose of the false accuser was what accuse falsely <laughs> that was it it was to accuse god's people and make them feel guilty and god through paul through peter was saying look your adversary the false accuser walks around as a roaring lion and we've already studied roar, roaring lions in the scripture and that those are people so that the pharisees were that serpent they were that false accuser and jesus even said your father is the false accuser and that's been going on forever okay so since then hebrews 2:14 the children have partaken of flesh and blood he also jesus likewise partook of the same that goes right along with philippians chapter 2 where it says he humbled himself he was found in fashion as a man and took upon him the form of a servant right he came it's what we call the incarnation right he came god in the flesh and he did that to take us from old into new from physical physical sacrifices physical temple physical high priest into spiritual sacrifices a spiritual temple a spiritual high priest things that are eternal in the heavens that's what we have in Christ so he partook of the same now watch this watch what it says that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death that is the false accuser In other words, we now are more than conquerors. For those of us who have believed in Christ, the devil has been destroyed. That's what it says. That's not me saying that. Because sometimes I don't feel like false accusers have been destroyed, right? But then I have to remember, at one time I was a false accuser, right? At one time I looked at salvation as something that was borderline to be earned, even though I was raised in church. and i was taught about grace i still had this wacky idea that my performance would somehow prove that i was a christian somehow prove that i was forgiven no actually it's the blood of jesus christ and what he does is he gives us his love and mercy the very mercy and love that he has shown us he gives us that for god's people and this is what 1st John says by our love for one another we assure our hearts before him isn't that beautiful aren't you glad i didn't say by your strict obedience to torah <laughs> right you assure your hearts before him what a drag what a drag because if it's true again that if we've transgressed one we've transgressed them all I mean how could you possibly feel safe if our salvation is proven by our obedience to the 10 commandments we should feel very very insecure <laughs> you know but no the bible says by your love for one another you assure your hearts before him and what is the best way to have to experience to really feel that spirit of love meditate on his love for you meditate on the cross therein lies your strength your power your assurance your salvation your ransom your reconciliation all of those beautiful terms we know that are kind of deep one of which is propitiation right which simply means the sacrifice that satisfied god's wrath made him smile fulfilled number 6 the great benediction the lord causes his faith to shine upon you meditating on his finished work meditating constantly. All right, so the children of God. There it is. You hear what these are saying, have you never read? 
you've prepared praise. All right. So Psalm 9, which is the next psalm, which means we probably won't have to spend as much time in it as we move on to our next psalm here in a week or two, two weeks, three. Psalm 9, verse 1 through 20. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. And in case you're wondering about your whole heart, I believe as believers that when we thank God, that is the demonstration of the faith in Christ that he has given us. And I know this may sound odd, okay, and, but I, I really believe that the Bible can confirm this. You've heard people say, oh man, I, I, I'm just striving to love God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength, right? What does is, what is the word of God say? The two great commands. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbors yourself. Well, if you look at John, the end of 1 John chapter 3, it says, he who loves God keeps his commandments. Well, surely that's not the 613 or even the 10. Now think about it. He who loves God keeps his commandments. Well, if we just stopped there, if we just stopped reading right there, we would think, oh gosh, is he talking about the Ten Commandments? Well, that would contradict James, who says, if you've transgressed one, you've transgressed them all. And it would certainly contradict Paul, who says that it's impossible for us to obey the law, because we've all broken it in our heart, if not outwardly, right? So what is it? First John says this, he who loves him keeps his commandments. And those commandments are not burdensome. And these are his commandments, that you love God and love one another. Isn't that beautiful? That you love God and love one another. Well, what are the two great commandments? If you, if you see all of 1 John, it speaks about this love for God. And then it says, these, these are his commandments that you believe on the name of his son and love one another. So to believe, are you ready? To believe on the name of Jesus Christ is to love the Lord God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. If you are truly a believer in Christ, you are always loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, always. Because the faith that God has given is untainted. It's faith that is pure. It's the gift of God. You either believe Jesus Christ or you don't. It's not, well, I'm kind of 75% there, <laughs> right? No, we're either trusting Christ or we're not. As simple as that. And one of the ways you know you are trusting Christ, you've trusted Christ 100% all the way, and that that faith will never go away just because, why? Jesus said, Peter, remember, I've prayed for you that your faith will never fail. And I highly doubt that Christ's prayer went unanswered. He says the same thing about us. In Romans chapter 8, it says he intercedes for us. He makes intercession for us. Christ is praying for us. We're his children. And he prays that we will never be lost. We will never be lost. And it also says in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25, he is able to save to the uttermost those who come to God by him, seeing that he ever lives to make intercession for us. He's always praying for us. And man, if Jesus is praying for us, those prayers will not go unanswered. They will not be nullified. That's how much he cares for us. We are bought with a price. He owns us and he prays for us, his children. Okay. So yes, we're always loving the Lord God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And I might add, <laughs> Paul says this, he quotes Isaiah, 
Isaiah says, looking forward to Messiah, Isaiah says, I has not seen, remember, we, we've typically applied this to dying and going to heaven or getting raptured, but no, 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 no. If we look at the context and we, we are so prone to doing this, we do what's called proof texting. Proof texting. We take one verse and isolate it and create a whole doctrine out of it. And so consequently, I hear this all the time at memorials where they say, eye is not seen, nor ear heard, nor is entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. Well, Paul quotes that from Isaiah. And Isaiah says, I has not seen, remember, I has not seen, nor is ear heard, nor is entered in the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who, what? Wait for him. Well, wait, waiting in the Old Testament, they were waiting for salvation. They were waiting for Messiah. They were hoping for Messiah. Proverbs says this, hope delayed makes the heart sick, but when the desire comes, it is a what? Tree of life. Well, Christ is that tree of life. And he's also called the desire of nations, right? So Isaiah says, eye is not seen, nor is ear heard, nor is entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who wait for him. Well, then that's it. He goes on to talk about other things. Paul quotes it and says it's fulfilled. And he says this, as it is written, and he had just been talking about the things that are now revealed in 1 Corinthians 2. He had just been talking about it. And he said they were hidden from those in the Old Testament and revealed for our glory. That's what he says in 1 Corinthians 2. And so then he quotes it. And this is what Paul says. I has not seen, I know I quoted it several times, but get this in your mind, solid. I has not seen, nor has ear heard, nor has entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. So Paul equates love with waiting, and so does Jesus. To wait, to have faith, to trust in God's mind, that is to love him, you see? And then what does Paul say? The things which God has prepared for those who love him, but to us they have been revealed. Our eyes have seen. What did Jesus say? Blessed are your eyes. Many wise men and prophets have desired to see the things you see, and they've desired to hear the things you hear. That was Old Testament. And Paul and Jesus are now saying, our eyes have been opened. Our ears have heard. It has entered into our heart. What? God, the Lord Jesus, dwells in our hearts. Okay? So it's really beautiful. And so I like, whenever I do memorials, and they're not, if I can be so bold, memorials are not my most favorite thing. <laughs> They're just not. However, I love to comfort the people of God with those who have put off this fleshly body, but to remind them that, look, these people are still just as much a part of the church as we are. We're still, every single one of these people who are believers in these pictures, they were a part of the church when they were with us physically, and they're still a part of the church now. And that's why we call this whole thing communion. Just because of person physical, I mean, picture us all together. And like, oh, do you remember this? Here's the church, here's the steeple, open the door and see all the people, right? Remember that? Here's the church, here's the steeple, open the door, see no people, <laughs> right? Well, here, here it is. So imagine, here's the church, here's all its people, and one of them physically dies, and we have somehow this idea that, well, they physically died, so they're not with us anymore. No, that's not true. And so I try to remind people that in Christ, we are all one and that never stops. That never stops. Yes, we're grieved at their physical presence being gone, but the word of God teaches us in Hebrews that we have come to the spirits of just men made perfect, just people. And it says we have come to an innumerable company of angels, but no one wants to read Hebrews, right? Because they think it's too difficult. All Hebrews is, is a contrast between the Old and New Covenants. So whenever you see something that's really beautiful and wonderful, the writer of Hebrews is saying, you have it all in the New Covenant. 
When you ever you see in something in Hebrews that is dark and and dismal and tempest and wrath, that was what the writer of Hebrews trying to convey to us. That was old covenant. So this new and everlasting covenant. That's what Isaiah says. He will make a uh, chapter fifty five. I will make an everlasting covenant of peace with them. And that's where you see the song, they shall go out with joy. You shall go out with joy, you know, uh, and be led forth in peace. And, and the trees of the field will clap their hands, right? It, it's all fulfilled in Christ, and it's so beautiful. All right. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. We sure do. I will tell of all your wonderful deeds. That is the cross and risen life and presence of Jesus. I will be glad and exult in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. When mine enemies, now watch, this is great. When my enemies turned back, they stumbled and perished before you. For you have maintained my just cause. How? The justice was served at the cross. That was it. The cross was God saying, boom, Christ, guilty. Boom, Christ, people, innocent. And then Christ rises and conquers the grave, conquers spiritual death and separation from God. And now he has given it to us, life in him. So you've maintained my just cause. You've sat on the throne giving righteous judgment, right? The Bible speaks about that. Um, it was a prophecy of Jesus. It says he will not judge by what he sees or by what he hears. Aren't we so quick to do that? You know, hearing gossip. It was a man I got. Oh, it was precious. I got a, my son Truman and I, we, we Marco Polo, leave each other video messages, right? And he's, he always does, not always, but a lot of times he does that coming home from, from work. He Marco Polo's me. And he said, pray for me that I wouldn't talk crap about other people. His, yeah, Aww. that's his language. <laughs> Sometimes I too. But anyway, that's what he prayed. What a wonderful prayer. And so the Bible says Jesus would not judge by what he heard or by what he saw, but that he would judge what? Righteous judgment. Righteous judgment, which is based upon faith in him. Faith in him. You have rebuked the nations. You have destroyed the wicked. You have blotted out their name forever and ever. The enemies have vanished in everlasting ruins. And we're thinking to ourselves, we're always thinking physically. You know, so many people read this, they think everlasting ruins and they picture a wasteland of buildings, you know, bricks crumbling, you know, like World War II or something in, in England. And it says, their enemies have vanished in everlasting ruins. Their cities you have rooted out. The very memory of them has perished. Now watch, but the Lord sits enthroned forever. He has established his throne for judgment, righteous judgment. He judges the world with righteousness. He judges the peoples with equity. The Lord is a stronghold. Here it is, stronghold. Remember, we're talking about strength, praise. The Lord is a stronghold for the oppressed. Pharisees were always oppressing people with their words. A stronghold in the time of trouble. And those who know your name, at the name of Jesus, amen, put their trust in you. For you, O Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. Sing praises to the Lord who dwells in Zion. The word of God teaches us that the church is Zion God dwells in us. Declare his deeds among the people, what he's done on the cross. For he avenges blood. He who avenges blood is mindful of them. He does not forget the cry of the afflicted. Be gracious to me, O Lord. See what I suffer from those who hate me. You are the one who lifts me up from the gates of death so that I may recount all your praises 
And in the gates of daughter Zion, rejoice in your what? Deliverance. And that's the same as salvation. Salvation is deliverance. The nations have sunk in the pit that they made. Remember us talking about the pit? When we, it, the Bible says, the enemies of God are caught in the snare that they lay for, that they set for the people of God. Remember we brought, we talked about Haman and him setting up those gallows to, to try and hang the Jews. And he ended up being hung in his own gallows that he made. And Jesus says, whatever standard you use with your mouth to judge others, that same standard is used toward you. And I always tell people, it's like, it's kind of the what goes around comes around. And we all have experienced it. And this is one of my most favorite questions, and I've asked it before, that I always ask people, have you ever done something you thought you would never do? And you go back and you remember those times where you did point the finger for that very issue, and then you found yourself caught in your net, caught in your trap, caught in your own snare, right? And so that's what's going on here. In the net that they hid has their own foot been caught. The Lord has made himself known. He's executed judgment. Watch, here it is. The wicked are snared in the work of their own hands the wicked shall depart to the grave, all the nations that forget God. The needy shall not always be forgotten, nor the hope of the poor perish forever. Rise up, O Lord, do not let mortals prevail. Let nations be judged before you. Put them in fear, O Lord. Let the nations know that they are only human. So now we're going to go to Psalm 21. And we're still looking at this defense being the blood of Christ, this defense being him conquering death. Psalm 21, verse 1 through 13. O Lord, in your strength, the king rejoices. And in your salvation, how greatly he exalts. This is the salvation of Christ. Again, these are new covenant prophetic psalms. You have given him his heart's desire. Ah, now we know what that means. I've heard so many Christians, and I used to think it too. Oh man, just ask the Lord, he'll give you the desires of your heart. Remember, we've, we've heard, all talked about that. Well, my desire is I just, you know, I really want to have a big house that overlooks the Pacific Ocean, you know, and, and just never have a, a cyclone come and take out the stilts from the house and fall <laughs> into the ocean. I just, Lord, that's sincerely my heart's desire. Mm -mm, that's not what it's talking about. Because I know that all of us have really had a heart for things or for people or for physical healing. I really have a heart. I mean, I, I, I can definitely, I could give you all kinds of stories about being a minister and, and people coming and telling you, can you come and see so-and-so? They're dying of cancer. They're on their deathbed, you know. And man, you just pray with your whole heart, Lord, please heal them, please. And in those particular cases, certain cases, God does, and in others, he doesn't. That's not the desire of the heart that he's talking about here. Look at it. Oh Lord, in your strength, the king rejoices, and in your what? Salvation, how greatly he exalts. You have given him his heart's desire and have not withheld the request of his lips. What was the heart's desire? Save, O oh Lord, save, save, save. I mean, that's what the blind men said to Jesus. Have mercy on us, son of David. Well, he detected their faith. But the lepers, remember, he healed all 10, but only one came back to give glory to Jesus. That's the true salvation. The heart that is grateful. I've been forgiven, I've been redeemed. For you meet him with rich blessings. You set a crown of fine gold upon his head. That is the crown of righteousness, the finished work of Christ. He has given us that crown of glory. He asked what? Life of you, you gave it to him. Length of days forever and ever. That's what uh, Timothy and 2 Corinthians says. He brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. We're immortal. We will never die. That's what Jesus said. Whoever lives and believes on him will never die. 
His glory is great through your salvation. Salvation and glory are synonymous. The Bible says God is our salvation. Think about that. God is our salvation. And so it makes sense that if he has given us his salvation, he's given us himself, his presence. His presence is deliverance. Splendor and majesty you bestow on him, for you make him most blessed forever. You make him glad with what? The joy of your presence. What does Psalm 16 say? In your presence is fullness of joy. It's as if the psalmists are repeating, reiterating these wonderful things that God wants reiterated in our hearts. He wants us to think about our relationship with him and what that means. It's eternal. For the king trusts in the Lord. Obviously, this is first speaking about Jesus and then us. And through the steadfast love of the Most High, he shall not be moved. I was, I was talking to, uh, who was I talking to? I don't know. I was talking to someone recently and they were worried that somehow their salvation was not secure. And I said, I, I just asked this question. I said, is your salvation rooted in you and your performance? If you have salvation and somehow your salvation can be forfeited by your lack of performance, now think carefully here. If your salvation can be forfeited by your lack of performance, who is maintaining your salvation? You, which means salvation by works. We don't believe that. We believe in salvation by grace. For by grace you've been saved through what? Faith. And that, not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So in other words, if I can forfeit my salvation, I'm the one maintaining it. And when I walk through them pearly gates, I get to say, Lord, thanks be to me, I did it. <laughs> right? Of course we don't believe that. Of course not. Rather, we say right now, oh Lord, I'm in your presence. And it's only because what? The steadfast love of the Most High, he shall not be moved. We can't be moved because of God's love. It's impossible. That's the power of God's love. What does the Bible say? God is love. God is love. So to talk about the power of God's love is to talk about God. The steadfast love of the Most High, he shall not be moved. By the Lord Jesus. God is love. He shall not be moved. You see, it's his power. That's what Peter says. He has kept us by his power. Jesus says, John 17, as he's praying, you have given him, his, the son, authority over all flesh that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. God, again, the father gave us to the Lord Jesus. And Jesus says in his prayer to the father, none of them is lost. And it says, your hand will find out all your enemies. And that's what the gospel does, your right hand. Who's the right hand of the Lord? It's Jesus. He sat down on the right hand of the throne of the majesty on high, Hebrews 8. Your hand will find out all your enemies, and that's the gospel. Remember, we saw the one in 2 Corinthians 2, where the savor of life unto God, where the sweet smelling aroma unto God, uh, in those who believe, and we are the sweet-smelling aroma unto God to those who do not believe. In other words, when we proclaim the gospel, that is God's power. He is doing his work, and we don't know who he's doing it in. You see, we proclaim it to all. Even Paul said this, I endure all things 
for the sake of the elect. And that, that Greek word elect is eklektos, which is where we get the word ekklesia, the church. Same, same root word. We just eklektos, ekklesia. Is where Jesus even says in Matthew 22, 14, he says, many are what? Called, but few are eklektos. So here is Christ saying, we've been churched. <laughs> we've been churched. You know, now it sounds weird, but if you look it up in the Greek, if you look up the word church, it's really beautiful. And Strong's Concordance says, chosen ones. Do we get to boast? No, absolutely not. We sit there and go, why would you choose me? I don't even know. I don't even know because it sure wasn't anything in me. But then he kind of gives us a clear answer in Ephesians. He says, he adopted us as his children according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace. So next time you think about that, why would God choose us? Why? It says, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace. That's it. You know, and so many people, you know, who've grown up in, oh, you know, in, in ancient Presbyterianism, right? Ancient, ancient, we're talking way back, way back. Pres Presbyterians generally uh, would like to say that they were, uh, that they were founded through a theologian by the name of John Calvin. But Paul preceded Calvin, by the way. <laughs> you know, I, I just, I think it's kind of foolish for us to call ourselves, well, I'm an Arminian, I'm a Calvinist, I'm a dispensationalist. I think what we need to say is, no, I'm saved by the blood of Jesus. Amen. That's it. That's it. And when someone says, well, why would he save you? according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, because I was a full-blown sinner loser. I had nothing. Paul said, there's nothing good in us. There's none righteous, and there's no one who seeks after God. Darn tootin', it wasn't us seeking after God, was it? The Bible says, Jesus, all we like sheep have gone astray, remember? And Jesus sought us. He went out and found us, threw us on his shoulders, brought, brought us back into the fold, right? And made us one of his. And now we're dwelling safely in these pastures. So it says, your right hand will find out those who hate you. And this is, I believe, this is prophesying of the Pharisees. You will make them as a blazing oven. Again, just metaphorical, uh, apocalyptic language. When you appear. And what that's very interesting because we see these very, in the Old Testament, we see as God would judge a nation like Assyria or Babylon or uh, even, uh, even Israel, um, he would use that kind of language. I will appear, right? It's just his way of saying, I'm going to judge you. And in fact, it's kind of interesting. There's one passage that says the Lord is known by the judgments that he executes. And nine times out of 10 in the Bible, it's usually through other nations. And so when we see what happened in that first century, according to the prophecy of Jesus, this generation is not going to pass away before you see this whole temple come down. By us being able to look back at the destruction of that temple, that was Jesus's way of saying, well, I did it. My sacrifice worked. Theirs didn't. I told them to believe on me. They didn't. I told them I'm going to destroy this temple. And I told them, you're going to be surrounded with armies, but they wouldn't believe. And so now where's the temple, the physical temple? It's gone. Where's the new temple? Right here. It's God's people. So the Lord will swallow them up in his wrath. Fire will consume them. You will destroy their descendants from the earth, which in all honesty, that's what he did. In fact, since the first century, since the destruction of the temple and the Pharisees, all the tribal records were destroyed. Did you know that? All the tribal, they have no tribal records being able to trace their lineage back to Abraham or David. You can't do it. You can't do it. You can't find it anywhere. 
So I think we have to really think about that when the Bible says we are the new people of God. He calls us the Israel of God in Galatians 6. He calls us true Jews who are circumcised in heart, right? But he spoke about those Pharisees and he said that he would destroy those who say they are Jews, but are not, but are of the synagogue, uses that word synagogue of adversary. And he did, he destroyed them. So he will destroy their descendants from the earth and their offspring from among the children of man. Though they plan evil against you, though they devise mischief, they will not succeed, for you will put them to flight. You will aim at their faces with your bows. Now, again, this is just hyperbole, metaphorical language. God does not have a big old bow, right? <laughs> He's not up there. Pew! You know? I mean, like God needs that. You, you know what I'm saying? You will aim at their faces with your bows. Be exalted, O Lord, in your, what? Strength we will sing and praise your power. Out of the mouth of babes proceeds a bulwark to remove your foes. That's what the gospel does. It removes foes. Psalm 31, I have heard the what? Slander of many. Slander. Fear is on every side. It was real. Think about that. Living under the old covenant. Having been caught in the act. And having these hateful, self-righteous people always wanting to put you to death. And we just see that in the Gospels. Jesus was so angry at the Pharisees. He was, he was, you never see him so angry as when he was talking with the Pharisees. He said, you, he said to the Pharisees, you are filling up the cup of God's wrath. That's what he said. And he says, he, it, they were so bad at the time of Jesus. Guess what Jesus said to them in Matthew 23? All the blood from righteous Abel. I mean, we're talking way back to Zechariah, whom you slew between the temple and the altar, shall be required of this generation. Jesus said that. I mean, how gnarly must that group of people have been in hating, in judging, in standing on street corners to be seen praying, wearing long robes, having the chief seats in the synagogues, right? Distorting their faces when they would fast so that people would know that they were fasting, right? I mean, we think about it and we go, gosh, how could they be so self-righteous? And then it's like, whoa, there but for the grace of God. You know what I mean? Praise the Lord. For I have heard the slander of many fears on every side because of their plottings together against me. They plan to take away my life, but I trusted in you, O Lord. I said, you are my God. My times are in your hand. Isn't that great? My times are in your hand. In fact, the Bible even says he has appointed the boundary of our habitation so that we cannot pass. Again, we cannot live one day longer than the day God has ordained for us to go. <laughs> Praise the Lord. That makes me happy. And we're not going to die ahead of that time either. God's got this. He's got that. Deliver me from the hand of my enemies, the slanderers, and from those who persecute me, the slanderers. Make your face shine on your servant. Number six, the prophecy, the great benediction, and that has taken place because of Christ. Save me in your mercy, he has. Let me not be ashamed. The Bible says whoever believes on him will not be ashamed, amen? O Lord, for I have called on you. Let the wicked be ashamed in guilt. Let them be silent in the grave. Let the lying lips be put to silence, false accusations. Slander. The lips which speak proudly against the righteous. We're righteous because of the blood of Christ, not because of our good deeds. With pride and scorn, how great is your goodness, which you have laid up for those who fear you. There it is, right? Eye has not seen, but now in Messiah, we have that goodness. 
You have worked for those who trust in you before the sons of men. You shall hide them. I love this. You shall hide them in the secrecy of your presence. That's the protection of God. He has hidden us in himself. We dwell in him and he dwells in us. From the pride of man, you shall hide them in a shelter away from, what does it say? What does it say there? The strife of tongues. Does everybody get it? Over and over, that's what we see. Tongues, accusations, slander. Blessed is the Lord, for he has worked his mercy wondrously in a besieged city. For I said in my haste, I'm cut off from before your eyes. Surely you heard the voice of my cries when I cried to you. Oh, love the Lord, all you his saints of his. The Lord preserves the faithful. In other words, because of faith in Jesus Christ, the faith that he gives, he's preserving us and plentifully rewards the proud doer. And that word there, proud, the reward there has to do with judgment. Every other place that the, that Hebrew word proud there is used has to do with arrogance and to be judged by the Lord. Okay? He be strong and he will make your heart stronger, all you who hope in the Lord. And of course, that strength was fulfilled through the blood of Jesus. Amen?